and welcome to the ISS MRO purchasing presentation of how to reduce MRO spend via UNSPSC analytics. My name is Andrew Weinstein and I am the CEO of ISS Group. I am joined today by my colleague Frank Salisi and our special guest, Mr. Bruce McIntyre. The agenda of today's meeting will be a brief overview of ISS Group, followed by an overview of the UNSPSC by our special guest. Then Frank Salisi will take over the controls and perform a brief demo of our e-procurement solution named iPurchase and how we've incorporated UNSPSC coding into our iPurchase solution. And then we'll have a very brief two-minute wrap-up. ISS Group was founded in 1986. We are now in our 27th year of business. For the first 14 years of our business, we were a reseller and implementer of various ERP solutions for the manufacturing and distribution community. More specifically, from 1995 to 2000, we were a reseller and implementation service provider for the QAD EA solution at that time known as MFG Pro. During that time frame, we were approached by QAD and asked if we would work jointly with them to develop their first B2B e-commerce application, which was named by Pam Locker herself, MFG Pro on the web, trading partner transactions. That solution was implemented by many of QAD's largest end user organizations, such as Ingersoll Rand, Tyco, Eaton, GE Lighting, John Crane, Schlumberger, Alan Bradley, and many, many others. That solution is still being used by many of those organizations to this day. Since 2000, we have been providing business process improvement solutions and consulting services to the QAD user community. This is a snapshot of our client base, the common denominator across all these clients, are that they are QAD end user organizations. And without further ado, I am now going to hand over the presentation to our special guest, Mr. Bruce McIntyre, who will provide us an overview of the UNSPSC coding methodology. Bruce? Thank you very much, Andy. I appreciate that. So the first thing I want to do is to ask you a question. Next. Do you have the ability to answer these questions? Now, this seems like an obvious question, but actually it's not. Do you really know how much you spend on uh, MRO products, services, and capabilities? Do you know what are the products that you buy and who you buy them from? The problem is because most companies focus on their production spend, their MRO spend tends to be not quite so complete. And this lack of analysis is costing businesses over $260 billion with a B in missed savings opportunities every year and this tends to grow every year. You know as well as I do, companies focus on the obvious things to save money, and MRO typically is more difficult to get your hooks into and find out where you can make savings. But that's really not the case today. Next. So what I want to talk about here with you today is the United Nations Standard Products and Services Code. This is very much an open international standard that is, uh, is very mature and 
available worldwide and implemented worldwide. What it is is a taxonomy of products and services that allows a organizations around the world to uh, have a common set of definitions of what they're selling and what they're buying to give them the ability to understand where they're spending the money and how. So this results in a very practical business tool to allow you to gain control of one of the more difficult areas of your business to control. Next. So what's an open standard? Well, you're all familiar with an open standard, whether you think so or not. When you take out, uh, when you go to your Starbucks store and take out your laptop and hook up to their Wi-Fi, that's an open standard. When you use your cell phone and you connect either Wi-Fi or over a, uh, a cellular connection, that's an open standard. What it means is this is not proprietary. This standard is available for all companies to read and implement without royalties or license fees for their usage. It also means that you can then collaborate with partners both on the uh, buy side and the sell side without uh, any restriction. The key here is this creates a level playing field without discrimination for the big guys and the small guys. And this allows any company to participate in an open and transparent manner. Even more so, this now generates an international acceptance of a code and because almost all businesses today do some level of their business internationally, it means that you can use the same model wherever in the world you do business. Next. So what's a taxonomy? Well, you all are familiar if you took biology in, in high school or whatever. A taxonomy is a system of classification, in this case, of products and services bought and sold. It creates a hierarchical tree structure that allows you to both drill down between various levels and categories, as well as roll up the output to do analysis to be able to operate at a higher level for analysis. This is widely used in the ERP space uh, and uh, Companies that have e-commerce systems are using their business intelligence capabilities to really be able to analyze this output. And because this is a common set of definitions, it makes it a lot easier to implement. There's a lot more resources, a lot more partners, and, and a lot more uh, support in order to make this work. Next slide. So here's an example. Again, if you went had a biology class, you know this. So the purpose is to elaborate and to enable a collaborative science across the world. So the key here is that the root is all living things. And so within this, there is kingdom and phylum and class and order and family and species. So within the kingdom of animals, uh, you can go to vertebrates, uh, which are a part of the phylum. Within the phylum of vertebrates, there is a class, which is mammals. Within the order of mammals, there is an order of carnivores. And within the order of carnivores, there is a family of felids. Now, within felids, which are the cat family, there are a number of species. And among these is felis. Sylvestris catus, or as we think of it, as the common house cat. Next slide. So how does this relate to the UNSPSC? The purpose here is to enable collaborative commerce. So the root 
level is all products and services. And within that, we have a breakdown by segment and family and class and commodity and potentially services. So if we look at this, if we apply a segment of 44, that relates to office equipment, accessories, and supplies. Within that, if we go to a family of 10 within the segment 44, that is office machines and supplies. And then we drop down to class, which would be duplicating machines. And the commodity, or the lowest level at this point, of 01 is photocopiers. This means that any time that you have a transaction involving photocopiers, it equates to a UNSPSC code of 44101501. Now, this seems a little complicated right now, but when you watch the demo from Frank, this is going to make a lot more sense. Next slide. So what are these advantages that I really want you to grasp as part of this presentation. First of all, the code is international and it is available in many languages. So this means that even if you implement this within a multinational organization or you have partners around the world, the code will stay the same regardless of the implementation language. So this means that when a code shows up in your transactions for photocopiers, it doesn't matter what the text of the legend is, because if you get the same transaction out of Japan or out of uh, the EU, the code is going to be the, the same regardless of the implementation language. Within this, there are segments for raw materials and industrial equipment, all the components and supplies you buy, and of course the end use products, and even the services that wrap around that. That means that there are over 25,000 categories to allow you to really drill down and capture the specific data, and yet roll that up in ways that allows you to manage it. Next slide. The UNSPSC code of 44103103 doesn't mean anything, does it? But as part of the code, there is a title in each of the languages that are supported, and that is up to 120 characters. An example in this case might be toner. field associated with this that allows free-form text that allows a much more complete explanation of what this code is about. On top of this, there's the capability of a business function, which means that you can allow for rental or lease or maintenance or repair or other ways that it's used. Now, why is this important? Well, here's an example. If you buy photocopiers in the U.S., but you lease them in Asia, and you rent them for some offices in the EU, you still are dealing with photocopiers. And even though your buying model is very different, you would be able to get visibility of that, uh, of that commodity within the code which means that you now know what your total spend for photocopiers are, regardless of the model you use for that purchase. Next slide. So here's the code structure. Again, as we talked about a couple of slides ago, there is this segment. Segment 40 is office equipment, accessories, and supplies. Within that, we can drill to the family, that is office machines, and their supplies and access. Class within that of 31 is printers and facsimile and photocopier supplies, and the commodity within that of 03 is for toner. So if anywhere in the system that you see 44103103, you know that it's for toner, 
that is used in as part of photocopier supplies, and it is part of the top-level office equipment and accessories. Why, this seems rather, okay, obvious, but if you're buying toner from various resources and various suppliers and various brands, it would be really great to roll this up and understand that if I go out to, say, a Staples, that I might be able to write a contract to supply all of my toner to all of my sites and uh, because I now know how much I buy from everywhere to be able to get a handle on being able to negotiate a contract that has much better pricing, delivery, quality, and availability. Next slide. Now, the, the core basic segments are, uh, include raw materials, industrial equipment, components and supplies, and end-use products. And on top of that, there's a whole group of segments for services. So this is a broad a categorical scheme and it can be extended and you can even extend it uh, in your own needs uh, you can create elements uh, for your own purposes that are not part of the standard code set as long as you and your suppliers and or customers agree upon that definition next slide now so what is the value where do you get the value out of this scheme. Number one is you now have the ability to automate the gathering and the analyzing of your spend data. You also get a uniform enterprise-wide view of what that spend is. You can do a roll-up analysis which allows you, as I said, contractable group identification. This means you can now go out and pick strategic vendors and build those relationships to supply these contractable groups and give you a much better centralized procurement function and leverage that volume for better pricing. Now, you can also use this to collaborate with both customers and suppliers because you now have a common classification system and we find that many companies will use this on both sides of the ledger. A big point here is to be able to control maverick spend or people that don't believe they have to work within the system. So if they are buying things that are outside of your normal business flow, you need to be able to identify what they're buying and who's buying it and where they're buying it from. This allows you to reinforce the use of your approved business processes and also it allows you to a classification system to make those processes a lot easier to use so that your people or requisitioners are much more likely to use them. The last level here you have the ability to reduce inventory. You may be buying uh, cleaning supplies from a dozen different sources under half a dozen different brand names and, and size of capacities of bottles or, or resources. If you suddenly have visibility to exactly what you're buying, where you're buying it, you may suddenly find that you have you know, four bottles of this, six bottles of that, and 12 bottles of that in a in a closet somewhere at one of your sites, but it's really all the same thing. It means you can now look at reducing inventory through product standardization, both in terms of usage and supply. Next. There is value for the suppliers here as well. So you're not trying to just impose something on your suppliers. They get a huge value out of this coding scheme. It allows them to facilitate selling their products, especially through exchanges, and allows them to work with you to qualify as a preferred supplier. It allows them to quickly uh, introduce new products through web services because the classification makes that immediately visible, and allows them to globalize their business 
because even if they implement this in multiple languages in different parts of the world, the underlying code helps their customers identify what they're buying and where they're buying it from. And finally, it allows them to then work and collaborate with their customers to improve their ability to respond to customers' uh, requirements for compliance and to increase their market share of their customers' spend. Next. So what is the value of this? How much good does it do? Well, here's a good example. Microsoft selected UNFCSE as its standard commodity classification system. They then told all of their hardware and uh, MRO suppliers to use the same version of the UNFCSE code. This rather simple sounding model allowed them to cut their spend by 1.4 billion, that's with a B, in just one year. And those dollars went right to the bottom line as profit. Next slide. Next. PPG, on the other hand, was more focused on really trying to capture and understand what it was spending. So they were able to capture more than 95% of their spend from 23 different data sources and bring that into a centralized database for analysis they were able to get a more than 10% savings, 10% of $5 billion, and a 90% reduction in supplier. Now, you know that every company today is working to reduce the, both the number of suppliers they get to be able to manage them at a better level. And the use of the UNSPSE cut significant time out of their total analysis of what their spend was, which allowed them to go back to their buyers and help them to consolidate their suppliers, to improve response time, to improve quality, and to reduce prices. Next slide. This works for smaller companies just as well as it works for big companies. Here's one quick example. A cutting tool manufacturer saved $1 million on an $800 million quick hit in negotiation by pulling together the purchasing that had been done through accounts payable and purchase orders and purchase card data to be able to go back and negotiate better prices and better quality and better response from their suppliers. Next slide. That was all very good, and that shows the value, but now we got to figure out how do you make it work for you. Next slide. There are several options for uh, classification systems here. Number one, you can tell your requisitioners they have to select the category up front as part of an e-procurement system. That means that they have to have either the training and the knowledge to do so, or the underlying system has to have the ability to do that for them. To do this, you can set up a manual in-house system. This is very low cost to get into and can give you immediate results for small volumes, but it becomes less consistent, requires a lot of user training and commitment in order to make work. You can also use classification-enabled software. This can semi-automate the process and can improve the quality, consistency, and productivity, but it still requires personnel commitment and can take longer to implement. Next. So these are your options. You can outsource it. You can go out to a supplier and have a service provider bring in the software and the experienced specialist uh, to make it work for you but you get very low ownership of the data. You may be locked into a solution and you have less flexibility. There are hybrid or phased options where you can outsource the initial high cost 
uh, capability, and then you can make sure your people learn and transition to in-house maintenance of these systems. Uh, and this has a value in avoiding some lock-in, but it still doesn't give you the ability to um, respond on an ongoing manner and make it work for you. Our approach that we recommend is what we're calling insourcing. I want you to utilize the efforts of your suppliers who get a major value out of doing this to build and maintain the coding schemes that you need, which allows you to then leverage your MRO purchasing community to take advantage of that, uh, of that work and that knowledge. Next. So what should you do going forward? How do you want to make this work? Plan for insourcing MRO coding by taking advantage of your supplier-led efforts for e-procurement. Make sure you define new business processes for all of your MRO purchasing and roll out access to e-requisition and your supplier catalogs that they have the capability to supply you with to all of your employees that do requisition. You do need to train your buyers in order to review the coding and search capabilities so that uh, you can now use them in a better manner and you can then build or buy the analytic reporting needed to maximize your buying contract. Next. So to realize these benefits, you need to be able to drill down to focus attention on the categories that represent the biggest spend that you do. Where is the, where is the best value for you? But also, you need to be able to roll up these identifiable contract groups to reduce the number of vendors you have to work with. This requires the use of decision support tools to allow you to identify the options for savings. And it means you have to train your buyers to review these coding and search capabilities. And Frank's gonna show you how easy that is to make work. And then you need to either build or buy some analytic reporting to maximize your ability to do buying contracts. Next. The key here is more than anything else. For every $1 in sales, a company spends 50 to 55 cents on purchase material. And the key is for every dollar that you reduce purchasing costs goes directly to the bottom line in a dollar for dollar profit improvement. Next slide. So here's the conclusion to manage the spend to improve the financial health of your organization. This means you need to rationalize your vendors, standardize the products you buy, leverage the volume of your buys to negotiate better pricing, and improve the operational efficiency of your purchasing function so your people will use these systems. I want you to to maximize these benefits and to do so, I'm going to let Frank show you how ISS has managed to make this work for companies using QAD software in real time. So at this point, I want to introduce Frank Salisi, who is the ISS Group VP of R&D, and is going to show you how this can actually work for you. And thank you very much. Thank you, Bruce. Good morning, everyone. Um, today we're going to look at iPurchase, which is our e-procurement solution for QAD. We're going to start off by looking at some of the analytics that iPurchase provides, and then we'll dive into how we actually gather this data uh, within the solution itself. Without further ado, let's talk about some of the graphing. Um, the goal of this screen is to provide your buyers the information they need to better negotiate contracts. Okay, we're going to see that now. 
We're looking at our purchase cost from the beginning of time. Everything that we've purchased in our database is being shown here, and it's being grouped by UNSTSC segment. So each of the bars represents a different segment of product that we've purchased along with the actual cost. The red line going across horizontally represents the actual line count of items, how many items we've purchased within that within each of these segments. Blue bars is our segments. Okay? So we'll see here that the elephant in the room is this column here, which is our material handling segment, also known as segment 24. Now when you're dealing with UNSPSC codes, you really don't have to know about the actual numbers themselves. Everything is in English, but we do show the numbers uh, just for reference. So we'll see that in segment 24, we spent about $4.5 million so far. We're going to be able to now drill down into that segment to identify what product families we purchased within the, that 24 segment. And we see we purchased products from four different families. Material handling, containers and storage, packaging materials, and packing supplies. And again, that 2411, the second column, is the, is the biggest spend, so we'll go into that one next. So in order to do that, we'll search only for 2411, and this time we'll drill down into the class. So this is now the two classes that we've purchased products from inside that 2411 family. And you'll see the first column is bags, and the second column, which is very little spend, is for corrugated supplies. And again, we want to drill into the bags because that's our biggest spend so far. And this time, we'll go in by component. Component is the lowest level UNSPSC classification. So it doesn't get any lower than paper bags. So we'll see here that we spent over $3 million on paper bags, and we spent almost $700,000 in plastic bags. Now these bags, it doesn't matter what the brand of the bags are. It doesn't matter the size of the bags. It doesn't matter which suppliers we bought these bags from. They're all classified as paper bags. They all have that same UNSPSC code, 2411-1502. Okay. Now that we've identified how much we're spending on a particular product component, we can now drill into that. Let's say we only want to look at paper bags. We can drill into that and look at that same exact spend based on supplier. You know, which supplier have we purchased these paper bags from? Okay, and you'll see here we spent 1.5 on from Hydrosco, about a million dollars from MSC, and about 600,000 from CDW. So we can see how much we're spending on a particular um, component of product by supplier. We can also look at it by date. You know, when am I buying these products? So we can see all the same information many different ways. And I've only shown you a couple of the ways so far. Okay. So now that we've seen how we can we can analyze this data, let us show you how we actually capture the data in the first place through I purchase. The first way of capturing data is through what we call a punch out. A punch out is when we actually shop or requisition product directly from a supplier's website. What you're looking at now is a partial list of suppliers that allow us to, to their website, requisition product, receive our contract pricing, and then automatically create purchase requisitions in iPurchase. Now, you have probably used one or more of these suppliers in the past. And again, it's only a partial list. I'm going to use CDW as the example today. So we'll go ahead and click on CDW, and you'll see that I am directed to the CDW website. Now the system does log us in 
the CDW in the background. So your users do not need to know the password information to get into CDW. The system takes care of all that. And because we are logged in, we are receiving contract pricing. What, once you're here, you just shop. Here's a looks like TV. I'll click into that TV and I will add that item to my shopping cart. Once it's in my shopping cart, I can check out. The difference between punch outs versus buying is that CDW knows that we're requisitioning. So they're not going to ask us for a credit card. Instead, we take the shopping cart that on their system and we transfer that into I purchase. And you'll notice here that I have a brand new requisition created for me with one line item, which is that widescreen television. The price comes through, and more importantly, if I go into it, you'll see that the UNS PFC code is provided by the supplier. So I didn't have to do anything to get that. Supplier provided me with that information. They know the products they sell. They know the best categories that it belongs to, so they categorize it for us. All of the punch-out vendors provide that capability of categorizing their products. So that's the first way um, we classify stuff in, QA, in uh, iPurchase. The second way is by manually creating line items. So Bruce used an example of a photocopier in his, pre in his presentation. So let's put in here a item number or a manufacturer number, which is a photocopier. I can fill in all this information, including the cost and the quantity and et cetera, but we're only looking at UNS PSC codes today and how we classify them. So as the originator of this requisition, when I create this line item, I then also put in a description here of what it is I'm buying. And you'll see I'm not using numbers, I'm using plain English, I'm, I'm classifying this to the photocopier, and the system will provide me the best matches for what I've keyed in. So you'll see here I have uh, facsimile accessories, I have photocopier supplies, photocopier belts, etc. These are all matches for the English that I entered. And if I scroll down, you'll see one of, the, one of my choices here is photocopiers. So I can go ahead and classify that correctly. Okay, so that, that's the second way that we classify product. By doing it manually, you'll see it was done with plain English, and you do not need to know that eight-digit number in order to use the system. All right, so now we've looked at two different ways. And by the way, you may have errors here because it is your originators making the, the decision of how to classify this. Your buyers do have the ability to go ahead and change this before it actually becomes a purchase order. So when it gets to the buyer for approval, they can change the UNS PSC classification. The third way is through what we call catalogs. Catalogs are when you have repetitive buys and the suppliers do not offer the punch out capability where you can shop directly on their website. You can set up catalogs directly in iPurchase by importing a spreadsheet. And that spreadsheet basically contains item number, description, price, and UNS PSC classification. Okay, and you can get that spreadsheet from your supplier or you can create it yourself, import it into iPurchase, and then your users can shop in the iPurchase catalogs. Now we have picked, we have used uh, UNS PSC on this page as well. These four fields, segment, family, class, and component, they all relate to the UNS PSC code. And we have built a hierarchy so that your users can drill down into the products they're looking for. So if I go ahead and click on segment, I see all of the product segments that we have loaded into our catalogs. Regardless of supplier, we can go ahead and choose a product segment. So let's pretend that today that I'm looking for bleaches to, uh, to clean the floors. 
I go ahead and choose cleaning equipment and supplies because that's the best category to meet my needs. From here, you'll see that a list of products which matches that product segment are displayed to me. The one thing they all have in common in this UNSPSC field, they all begin with a 47. The 47 equates to the cleaning equipment and supplies segment. I can then drill down and I have two choices in this particular category. I have cleaning and janitorial supplies and I have janitorial equipment. Well, since I'm looking for bleaches, I will go ahead and click on the supplies family. And again, we see more products. This time it's narrowed down to only showing us supplies. And what they have in common is they all begin with a 4713. Okay, because that 13 represents the family that I have selected. I'll go ahead and drill down further into cleaning and disinfecting solutions. Again, I'm looking for bleach. And now we'll see the first six digits are all the same okay, on all these line items. The 18 represents the class. Finally, I'll drill down into my bleaches. And you'll see here that I have three different bleaches available to purchase. They may be different brands, they're different suppliers, but they're all classified as bleach. From here, I can add those to my cart create, and create a requisition. And the UNSPSC data does flow through onto my requisition. Okay, so we can capture the data that way. Now, Bruce began his presentation asking a question, and that question was, do you know how much money you spend for each supplier on MLO products and how much you spend on each product itself. With a tool like I purchase, that information is at your fingertips. Andy, over to you. Thank you, Frank. Terrific. You can please pass the presentation back to me. We will wrap it up. So there you have it. So thank you so much to our special guest, Mr. Bruce McIntyre, and thank you to my colleague, Mr. Frank Salisi. For more information, you can visit the UNSPSC website at www.unspsc.org. Also, please visit the ISS Group website where you find more information on US UNSPSC coding and also our solution by purchase. Once again, we appreciate you taking the time to view our presentation today, and we hope that you attend more presentations from ISS Group.